Hello everyone, this is Richard from Modern Health Spanning. In today's newsletter, we will talk about the FDA approval of a new Alzheimer's drug, NMN working as part of a cocktail of growth factors to help restore hair growth, a small worm which was resuscitated after 24,000 years, and more. First, a disclaimer that in this newsletter, we are sharing some news items and recent papers that we found it interesting. It is not a recommendation or medical advice. Last week, we announced a membership scheme for those who wanted to support us on a regular basis. We are very grateful to those who signed up. First, we would like to give a shout out to our supporters who were very generous to buy us some coffees. It encourages us to continue to share information on aging research. Thank you so much for your support. Our first section today looks at the therapeutic effects of Growth Factor Cocktail, or GFC, when combined with Fibroblast Growth Factor 5 Short, FGS5S, and nicotinamide mononucleotide, NMN, for people who are suffering from hair loss. Growth Factor Cocktail is a mixture which contains growth factors and cytokines and has been gradually gaining attention as a new treatment for hair loss. Several studies reported the effectiveness of GFC on hair regrowth via microneedles. However, studies regarding formulations with FGS5S and NMN have not been conducted. FGSF5, or fibroblast growth factor 5, is a chemical which prolongs the period of growth of hair, while NMN is involved in the cellular energy metabolism and helps promote hair growth. NMN was a freeze-dried powder and was dissolved in saline before use. In this study, patients with androgenetic alopecia, which is a common cause of hair loss in men and women, were treated six times for a total of three months at two-week intervals from the first visit. The scalp was divided into two sections at the time of treatment. The right side was treated with GFC and FGS5S and NMN, and the left was treated with normal saline. Using microneedles, the mixture was applied topically, then the microneedles were used. A total of 20 patients, 11 males and 9 females, were included in the study. Clinical photographs and phototrichograms were performed before and two weeks after treatment to determine the final treatment effect. The phototrichogram images of the scalp treated with GFC for three months showed increased hair density. In contrast, there was no change in hair density in the scalp treated with normal saline. In this image, A and B, right and left, are both before treatment, and C is after treatment with GFC, and D is the control. Here is the result shown graphically. We can see the significant increase in hair density with GFC, FGS5S and NMN in comparison to the saline. In the previous image, because it was a small portion of the scalp, it was a bit difficult to see, but this graph more clearly shows the difference. We are taking NMN orally. Both my wife and I experience is that we have more hair and that it is thicker. Our hair has not changed back to dark colour, but we do have anecdotal evidence from our audience that it has made their hair darker. It would be really interesting to see if NMN worked on its own if applied topically. Let's have a look at a study which links going to bed late with the chance of major depressive disorder or MDD. The reason that this is important is that it has been shown that getting up early is associated with less risk of MDD, but causality was uncertain. The purpose of the study was to clarify this risk. The study looked at 840,000 people and represents the strongest evidence so far that chronotype, a person's preference for time of sleep, influences depression risk. It was also the first study to quantify how much change is needed. The researchers took data from 23andMe and the UK Biobank and used Mendelian randomization to try to decipher cause and effect. Mendelian randomization is a method of looking at genes which affect certain outcomes and is based on the principle that genes are random in the population and so avoid confounders and reverse causation. As they say here, our genetics are set from birth and so will not be impacted by the environment. In this case, 340 common genetic variants influence a person's chronotype, and between 12 and 42% of our sleep time preference is genetic. So the question they asked is, do genetic variants which predispose people to be early risers also have a lower risk of depression? 
And the answer is yes. Each one hour earlier for sleep midpoint corresponds with a 23% lower risk of major depressive disorder. So a person moving their sleep starts time from 1 a.m. to midnight has a 23% less risk of depression and moving sleep back to 11 p.m. makes this 40% less. Why is this? The fact that early risers get more light exposure is one theory. While another is that our society is set up for early risers, so late risers feel out of sync. Advice from one of the key researchers is, keep your days bright and nights dark, which is certainly what we try to do, getting sun exposure in the morning, going to bed early and having the room as dark as possible. Does lifestyle intervention help for overweight or obese adults with type 2 diabetes? The study reviewed the findings from a trial of 5,145 overweight or obese adults with type 2 diabetes in which the participants had intensive lifestyle intervention. The primary outcome was cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Secondary outcomes included a broad range of health parameters related to diabetes and obesity. The review summarizes the history of the trial and presents findings related to the health outcomes. ILI was generally positive for diabetes control and complications, depression, quality of life, sleep apnea, incontinence, brain structure, and healthcare use and costs. And composite indices also improved. But some measures did not improve, including cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, cancer, cognitive functions, and impairment. It is interesting that different subgroups reacted differently, raising the possibility that ILI may help some people but potentially be harmful to others. Though the final summary is, weight loss should be encouraged. That makes sense given the large number of bad effects tied to excess weight. The first drug to target the underlying causes of Alzheimer's disease has been approved by the FDA. Aducanumab won approval from the FDA this week using the accelerated approval pathway. This is from the FDA website. The accelerated approval program allows approval of drugs for serious conditions that fill an unmet need based on a surrogate endpoint. A surrogate endpoint is a marker rather than a measure of clinical benefit. In this case, the surrogate marker is a reduction of amyloid plaque in the brain, as a buildup of amyloid plaque is thought to be one of the main causes of Alzheimer's. So the drug does not need to show that it can improve Alzheimer's, but rather that it can reduce the plaque. As a note, the FDA has required another trial be carried out while the drug is available. The drug will be the first approved for reducing clinical decline in Alzheimer's and the first for reducing amyloid plaque. I think that this is newsworthy as is the first for a drug that might tackle the source of Alzheimer's rather than the symptoms and also interesting to see the FDA approval based on a marker. Will this open the way to drugs which affect the markers of aging? This is an amazing story. A living 24,000 year old rotifer was recently excavated from the Siberian permafrost. Here is the animal. It is a small multicellular animal which lives in water or damp environments. They have been known to survive extreme conditions such as dehydration, freezing, starvation, and low oxygen levels. But reviving one that was 24,000 years old really shows how tough they are. The previous record for revival was 30 years for a frozen tardigrade. This shows that a multicellular organism can be frozen for thousands of years and come back to life. Of course it will be trickier for more complex organisms, but rotifers have guts and brains, so this is a big step forward. The big issue with freezing is ice crystals, as we discussed with Professor Goya in our video about cryopreservation. So rotifers must have some way of shielding themselves from the effects of ice crystals. A better understanding of how they do this may help us with cryopreservation of human cells and organs. And more speculatively, provide more hope to the cryonics movement that attempts to freeze people for later resuscitation. I think this is just amazing, that an animal can retain in stasis for such a long period of time. Who knows, if we can do that to humans, it could be a way of preserving people during long distance space travel. I hope that you found the video informative. 
please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell button for any new video release notifications. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well, and we'll speak to you again soon.